you know, there's a lot of things that you're just not going to understand until you get out in the uh, real world. Uh, well, you're here to learn from this school um, so that we can prepare you for the real world. Did you ever hear that saying? Uh, we're going to talk today in this sermon here about what the quote-unquote real world actually is and how that when people tell you that they're preparing you for the real world, life in the real, real world, uh, how they're actually lying to you. Okay? Um, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The vast majority of people that tell you that they're going to get you ready for the real world are actually saying, we're going to mind control you and brainwash you so that you don't look at the real world. They create an artificial, illusionary world that exists to blind your eyes to what's really going on. And who's behind it? 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Who is the God of this world? Well, I heard uh, James White, the crazy little Calvinistic nut that he is, um, came out and he said, The God of this world that blinds people's eyes is actually God, as in Jesus Christ. So the Lord blinds people's eyes. Crazy. But see, if you're a hyper-Calvinist, then you have to believe that because God would actually blind the non-elect so that they can't get saved because he didn't predestinate them for salvation. You see, a Calvinist believes that God creates certain people that they cannot get saved no matter what they do. Nobody has free will, according to a Calvinist. All right? And you get hyper-Calvinists, they get even worse. You get you know, much deeper into the doctrines, the tulip, the five points of Calvinism. You can study that on your own if you don't know what that is. But um, God actually, in the Calvinist, Calvinistic system, he damns people to hell without them ever having any chance of getting saved, uh, which contradicts so many scriptures, it's just crazy. But uh, it's not, you know, the Lord. It's being spoken about there in the first part of verse 4. It's the devil. Satan has dominion right now. You know, when Jesus is taken out into the wilderness, with, and he's out there in the wilderness, I should say, and the devil takes him up to a, a high mountain, and he says, you know, if you fall down and worship me, I'll give you the kingdoms. Jesus doesn't turn to him and say, what are you talking about? You don't have any right to do that. Mm -mm, no. Satan has dominion over this earth right now. Okay? He is the God of this world. And what does he do? He blinds people as to the reality of what the real world really is. I'm going to show you from Scripture today what the real world is all about. And why most people actually want to be blinded by Satan. They don't want to look at the harsh reality that is all around them. We'll talk about that more as we continue, but continue reading here in verse 4. Go back to the beginning. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Jesus Christ is the image of God. But you get a lot of heretics out there saying, no, he's not the image of God. He has his own image. God the Father has his image, and God the Spirit has his image. They're three separate persons. They're not, there's not one being called God that consists of body, soul, spirit. Again, that's a, a whole big study there, but Satan blinds people's minds, and they get this idea of a trinity, three separate gods, and they're all just one in purpose and unity and whatever else. That's an ancient pagan philosophy comes back to Egypt and a lot of the other ancient cultures and things. Isis, Horus, and Set. That's why the Jesuits to this very day have their IHS. Okay? A lot of pagan cultures and a lot of pagan people still worship the Trinity. Okay? Something to think about there. But you see, Satan blinds people's eyes. I mean, think, think about this. I remember my grandfather used to be a chalk talk artist. Uh, Milton Denlinger was his name. And he would he'd write on his chalk talks. Um, I don't have any on video. I wish I did. But it was way back 1940s and 1950s, I think, when he was doing a lot of his chalk talks. When my, my father was a little boy, and he would go around with his siblings and grandpa and grandma, you know, his parents, and they would go around to, to, to different churches and things. And grandpa would draw, you know, like Peter Ruckman, like the, this type of stuff back here. My grandfather would draw it. My grandfather was an artist. Um, but I remember he used to have a saying that he would say, if every man knew, see if I can get this right, um, five seconds, if every man could see while he was alive what he sees five seconds after he dies, everybody would be saved. 
Yeah. Yeah. But why don't people see it? Well, because our scripture here in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says that Satan blinds their eyes. You're blind to the reality of eternal things. Most people out there, that's true of them. Most people do not think about heaven and hell. Most people do not think about the spiritual world and, and how this world really, really came into existence. We'll get more into that here in just a little bit. Most people don't think about that stuff. It's all about the here and now. What are we doing today? What are we going to do this afternoon? How about the weekend? How about vacation time coming up? They don't think about, what about eternity? What if the Bible really is true? What if there is a place called hell where those that reject Jesus Christ burn forever and ever? Oh, I don't want to think about that right now. So what does the devil do? The devil provides lies and illusions to blind people's eyes so that they don't look at reality. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. We're going to go through some scriptures here just talking about what the real world is all about. 1 John chapter 5. And again, you know, I'm, I'm telling people to look up things in their King James Bible. This isn't my opinions or my feelings or preferences or whatever else. Um, read the scriptures yourself. This is God's communication to man. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 19. And we know that we are of God. Yes, you can know that you are saved. Yes, you can know that you're going to go to heaven when you die. Let me go back to verse 13 real quick. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. If you're in some kind of religion out there that does not give you assurance of your salvation, then you're in the wrong one. God has written to you in a book here so that you can know that you have eternal life when you die. Well, nobody really knows for sure. Well, then you're in the wrong system. Uh, you watch these videos and I will show you and show you how to have an assurance of your salvation. How you can know for sure that you're saved. Um, I talk a lot about false converts in a lot of my studies. Why? Because I want those false converts to think about what they really believe in and examine themselves from the scriptures and say, okay, I need to make sure that I'm saved and get right with the Lord. I was a false convert for many, many years. The product of a false childhood conversion in Sunday school, going to church as a, as a little boy. I was a product of false conversion. And I had to come to the place where I came to the end of myself and say, you know what, I'm not saved. And I don't care about anything else out there. All the, all the lures and lusts of the world out there I don't care about that. I need to get saved. I want to know for sure I'm going to go to heaven when I die. You can have that assurance. And the Lord gave it to me when He saved me. Not when I saved myself. Not when I joined the special little group of people that, that we all know. No. Personal relationship. God saved me. His Holy Spirit moved in to me. And He changed my life. Know what I mean? Down here. Verse 19, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. Hmm. When you get saved, you'll have assurance of salvation. You know that you're of God. You know you're born again. And the second part of that is you'll understand that the whole world lieth in wickedness. When you truly are born again, all of a sudden, the blinders that the devil had on you, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, those blinders come off and you look around and you think, Oh my word, there's evil everywhere. The whole world lieth in wickedness. And I get these false converts all the time. Oh, you think the devil's behind everything? Oh, you think things are so bad? And you think, oh, no, that's what the Bible says. The whole world lieth in wickedness right there. You reading it? Do you have a King James Bible? Okay, shut the video off. Read the verse for yourself. What's it mean? You don't need me to interpret it. The whole world lieth in wickedness. No, no. Parts of the world and other parts are good. No, the whole world lieth in wickedness. There are so many conspiracies. There are so many evil things going on behind closed doors and all kinds of things like that. The whole world lieth in wickedness. And when you get born again, you realize that. And you realize... I was deceived in so many different areas. I was believing lies. I was, I was perpetuating this stuff. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't know. And, 
and the Lord in His gracious mercy for you, when you become a child of His, He will lovingly lead you along and He'll show you those deceptions. And you might be saved five or ten years and the Lord will show you something that you've been doing that whole time as a saved Christian. He'll show you, uh, son, daughter, you need to stop doing that. What, what, I don't understand. Lord say, well, here's the origin of that thing. I didn't know that. I didn't know it came from that system. And I didn't know I was part of that. Lord, I'm sorry. What's going on? The whole world lieth in wickedness. You go to the grocery store as a saved Christian going through the process of sanctification, and you start looking at those, all that food on the shelf, and you say, oh, that stuff's got high fructose corn syrup in it, that stuff's got aspartame in it, that stuff's got MSG in it, that stuff's got here, to, and you think, this stuff's toxic. This is poisonous. This is bad. What is this poison doing in food? And you think, my word. And you see these people, and they're just shuffling along and in terrible health, and they're dying, getting it there and getting this food in there, and you're thinking, these people are poisoning themselves. Don't they see it? They're blind. They're blind. Turn next to Psalm 39. The devil's tricked them. He has them thinking that they're uh, living in the real world. And in reality, they're totally blind to the reality of what's really going on. Psalm 39, verse 5. Another thing that you're going to realize when you get born again. Behold, thou hast made my days as an handbreadth, and mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. That's another thing that you realize when you get saved. You look at yourself in the mirror. You know you're looking prideful and you know, try to flex my arms here and say, "Oh boy, looking good. I got to get a haircut. I want to make sure that my clothes are." On. You get saved and you just look at yourself in the mirror and you think, "You weak, sickly old sinner, you. <laughs> you do. Why on earth would you ever save this thing, God? My word." Boy, and you get saved and you you know you're going along. You're doing good. Sometimes then you just fall and you do some kind of sin that you think. I thought I had victory over that thing. I mean, that was stupid. Why did I do that again? Why did it, you know, these words come to my mind and this music comes back into my head and I start singing along to these secular songs that I've, you know, cut out and whatever. What's going on? Every man in his best state is altogether vanity. The best you can do is vain. That's the real world, friend. I don't want to hear about this stuff. This this is negative preaching. This is uh this is this is hate mongering. This is intolerance. This is bigotry. This is uh -huh. yeah. You can't handle the real world. You see, when you understand the real world, you start to look out there and you say, "Well, that person's crooked. Look at that. I can't believe that they did that." And this, yeah. You can all of a sudden start to realize why the Lord said, "There's none righteous. There's none that doeth good. No, not one." You start to realize it. And then you stop thinking these foolish things that lost people like to talk about, like how could a loving God send anybody to hell? You get saved, you realize God's justified in sending everybody to hell. And it's only His mercy and His grace that saves wicked little sinners like me. Yeah. And then you just fight and fight and fight and fight and fight for the rest of your life, this wicked flesh. And you realize it's a losing battle. But you got still got to fight, and it's wonderful. It's a wonderful Christian life, you know. And Lord, you know, I I honestly think if Lord hadn't saved me, physically, uh, you know, spiritually, I'm saying save me. But if if the Lord hadn't saved me back then, and I wasn't born again physically, I'd have been dead by now. The kind of unhealthy eating and everything else I was doing. I thank the Lord for the process of sanctification. I thank the Lord that He made me a new creature. If I had stayed as the old man, it would have killed me talking about that with my wife today. I said, you remember back when we first got married? You know, when I first got married, I was in terrible health. I mean, just awful. Sick all the time. Headaches all the time. Just, I mean, it was awful. And 
my wife and I started, we dedicated ourselves, let's eat healthy, let's let's start to get into natural healing and things like that and herbology and 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 whatever. And all and I, I feel better now than I did as in my early twenties. I'm forty four years old now. You know? What's going on? Um, I'm opening up my eyes to the real world. I used to be one of those guys that would laugh as I'm drinking my soda pop and eating my fast food. And uh, I'd laugh at these people, these herb people and these natural health people. <laughs> you know, you got to die of something. You know, at least I'm going to die with a smile on my face. So I'm drinking my Dr. Pepper or whatever else. Yeah, and I was sick all the time. Really living the life there, you know. Now I'm healthy. I don't get sick that much. I thank the Lord for that. The process of sanctification is not a negative thing. It might seem negative for those people who can't accept the real world. But uh, when you start to realize this whole world's evil, every man in his best state's altogether vanity, whole world life and wickedness, I should say it that way, you start to want that change. Lord, I know I'm corruptible. I know I'm never going to, you know, at my best state, I'm just vanity. My life is just, you know, there's all kinds of problems there, but uh, please help me do my best at cleaning this thing up. I want to live to the to the very best ability that I can so I can serve you with my life. That should be your prayer as a Christian. Get back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, show you another verse that discusses the real world, the reality of this world. And I'm going to go over a couple examples after I'm done here with the scriptures. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Actually, we'll start in verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment. You realize how vain your life is, the vanity of life. It's just a little bit, a little bit of time that you have. Worketh for us a far more exceeding and internal weight of glory. It's all about heaven. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. That's the reality there. That's the real world. You look down at this and you say, this is all second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Everything's going to get older. This, this uh, painting here, this, this banner, this is going to fade in time. It's eventually going to get holes in it. It's going to tear. Uh, this clo these clothes here, my hair is getting grayer every year. <laughs> it's, everything falls apart. Everything gets worse with time. Say more about uh, something here in just a couple minutes about evolution. We'll get back to that. But uh, when you get saved, all of a sudden the blinders fall off. You start to see the whole world lieth in wickedness. Every man in his best state is altogether vanity. And you say, you know what? The temporal down here, this isn't it. This isn't what I should be basing my life on. Why? It's all going to just burn and it's all going to fade away and be nothing. I mean, it'd be like getting stressed out over, you know, building a snowman in the early part of the winter, if you live up north, and springtime comes and it starts to get warm and you start to stress out. I, I got to preserve the snowman. You can't do it. Outdoors. <laughs> And to be insane to try and get a freezer or whatever else and preserve your snowman in the freezer or whatever for the rest, you know, it's crazy. It's going to melt. It's going to go away. So are you. Um, you might want to stop looking at the temporal things. Hmm. You can turn next to Ephesians chapter 6. And here is the big one. Okay, this is the one you really need to understand. When you start to realize the spiritual realm is there, and you start to realize, okay, evolution is nonsense. There is a God. He created this world, and I need to find out who He is. I need to start understanding this book right here. Um, don't tell me that religion is the opiate for the masses or whatever else. Um, that's a bunch of fools saying that. That they can look at this natural world and say, it just happened by a random accident at some unknown time in the past. Everything came from nothing accidentally. Um, you're an idiot, okay, if you believe that. If you truly, really do believe that, have your head examined, please. Do the rest of us a favor. I mean, it, it just, everything came from nothing accidentally. Yeah, 
Um, no. You start to look at the real world and you start to realize, hey, wait a second here. There's a spiritual dimension here. Look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. It's not the Republicans' fault. It's not the Democrats' fault. It's not communism. It's not Catholicism. It's not whatever. What's really behind it? It's not flesh and blood, in other words. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a spiritual hierarchy. And that spiritual hierarchy, uh, you're not going to be protected from them by the Constitution or the Bill of Rights or whatever laws are in your land. Common law or something like that. They don't care about laws. Laws can be broken that are written by man. Okay? Um, but there's a set of laws that aren't going to be broken. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not. You say, who said that? Oh, the God of heaven. God manifest in the flesh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not a separate person, you see. He is the express image of God. And he came down to this earth and he said, everything's going to pass away that you're seeing down here, all this temporal stuff, but my word won't. You come along to any ministry that does not exalt this book, you better leave that ministry. You better run away from it. If a ministry is out there and they don't hold this King James Bible up as the final authority, uh, run away as quickly as you can. Okay? They need to be pointing you to the King James Bible for English-speaking Christians. All right? That's very important. But I'm just going to go over a couple things of this whole what is the real world. Okay? Just give you a couple examples, things you need to watch out for, so to speak. Just some examples of what I'm trying to say here. Uh, what is this real world thing all about? The spiritual. Okay? It's not the flesh and blood thing. It's spiritual. Number one, you would have public school and university. All right? You go off to public school and they will tell you that we're getting you ready for the real world. Uh, you need to learn how to be socialized. You need to go and you need to be there and you need to understand the thing of we're going to take you through these different classes. We're going to have, you know, math and, and uh, you know, English and we're going to have an, uh, science, you know, and we're going to take you through all this different stuff. Um, and that way you'll be ready for the real world. And, you know, I remember hearing that growing up and I'd think, okay, um, what am I in some kind of special bubble that I'm not actually in the real world? And like when I leave school, I just kind of momentarily pop out of the out of the you know happy world and I go into the real world for just a minute or two and get into the bus back into happy world land or something. What is this real world that they're talking about? But upon graduating and all these years later, the Lord showed me the truth and and I've done many, many thousands of hours of research, uh, read a lot of books and things, and, and um, done a lot of study over the last number of years. And I start realizing, you know, in school they never taught us. I remember they mentioned the Reformation um, and Martin Luther. And at the time I was confused because I thought that they meant Martin Luther King Jr. And, and no, this was a different Martin Luther. And I, I remember I was all confused about that. Well, what's this all about? What, what happened? And it was, well, they have some troubles with the, the church and, and there were some things and whatever. Okay, next lesson. You know, and, and you think, okay, but really, what really happened there? You know, they never really told us. They never told us about the creation of the Society of Jesus, also known as the Jesuit Order. Uh, what's that all about? We had no idea. What's the uh, Freemasonic system all about? What is Freemasonry? Never taught us. So we can drive by Masonic Lodges to and from school, but we're not allowed to be taught what a Masonic Lodge is. I remember my wife telling a story, that, you know, as a little girl, she was in a parade, you know, not in a parade, but she was watching one in her hometown and there in Iowa. And I remember she said these, sh these Shriners are driving in little cars with their stupid red fezes on their heads and driving their cars. And she said to her parents, she said, what are those guys? What's this all about? Oh, you know, just they're, they're, it's just a kind of a club. That, don't ask questions. It was a question about the real world. She's going to school to be educated. Why not tell her? You see? And how many times do children in public schools have legitimate questions about the real world and they're told shut up don't ask that question 
Well, then is public school about getting children ready for the real world or is it about getting you blinded to the reality of the world? The second one, okay? And I said this before, I'm going to kick this hard here, and that is this theory of evolution. Theories hatched up uh, from the philosophers, oh, I think that things just kind of evolved and whatever else, and man's getting better and better till they become gods. Can't really come up with anything new. That was Satan's lie to the Eve in the Garden of Eden, way back at the beginning. You can be, be as gods, knowing good and evil, um, whatever. But they come up with this theory of evolution, which is just so foolish, and it's just taught in schools. You're an animal. You came from an accident in the past, and there's nothing for you. There is no spiritual. It's all just temporal. Um, and it's not that the whole world lieth in wickedness, you see, because the world is evolving. So therefore, the world's getting better. It's going to be a better place to live in 100 years than it is today. Never mind the second law of thermodynamics. Never mind erosion and entropy all around you with the sun breaking things down and with war and with disease and famine and earthquakes increasing. And never mind that stuff. Don't think about that. Oh, but we can teach you global warming. And, and you know, it, it's just, it's so messed up. And then you go off to the university scam, and it is a scam. And there they try to destroy your faith in this book right here. If you have any left until you get to the university, if you're going through the public school system, you wouldn't have much. But you get to the university scam, and you get there, and they tell you that you're going to be successful. We are preparing you for the real world. And you come out with a huge debt that many times you can't even pay off. And you get out there, and you realize that the job that you're supposed to be getting because you're college educated, you come out and you say, look, I have the degree. Who wants to hire me? And nobody hires you. And all of a sudden you got this huge, big, massive debt about the size of a mortgage for most people and you can't pay it off. And if even if you can get a job in your chosen, you know, college thing, you know, that you went through there, your, your major that you studied in, um, you're still having a hard time paying off your college debt. And I forget what the number is. I heard a number recently. It's just huge. I mean, it's just, I think it's over a trillion dollars in student loan debt right now in America. Um, I don't think they're getting people ready for the real world. You see what I'm saying? Give you another good example of the real world. This is a, a classic here. The JFK assassination. All right. Another example of people saw the real world and yet they say, nope. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to know. Don't tell me about this whole thing. Think about this for a minute. You have this disgruntled guy, Lee Harvey Oswald. He doesn't like the president. He wants to defect and go to Russia and whatever else. And he sees the president coming and he takes his gun and bang, acts alone and kills the president right in front of everybody. And they give you this story. The Warren Commission comes out and gives this story. And, uh, you know, and you're just to believe that. Um, but yet even a common understanding of how things work, just physics, you can't be shot from behind and your head go back. It doesn't happen. It can't happen. And, you know, I actually have something here today I will show. This is actually a, the type of gun that Lee Harvey Oswald supposedly used. This is a Manlicher Carcano, Italian gun, um, and the thing is, this was actually given to me many years ago. It was in really bad shape. I cleaned it up and fixed it up and everything else. But uh, it's kind of funny, a little story here. Tell a story about this thing. Uh, went to a gun shop, had the guy check it out and everything. And I said, what do you think it's worth? He said, uh, let me show you. Got the blue book, blue book value out of, of guns. $25 is what this gun was worth. <laughs> and its condition is that it was in, uh, which was fair condition. He was kind with it. Um, and I fixed it up, refinished it and everything. But I said, uh, well, I said, I'd like to shoot the gun. I said, it, it'll, everything's fine. He said, yeah, I checked it out. Firing pin's fine. All the springs inside, everything. And I said, uh, what's a box of ammunition cost? Okay, the gun's worth $25. He said, a box of ammunition is going to cost you $37. <laughs> so the ammo for this gun is worth more than the gun. Okay, but this is the gun that supposedly Lee Harvey Oswald would have shot. Not this exact one, but, you know, one like this. And, I mean, the action on this thing, it's a bolt-action rifle, and it's really, really long, goes way down, 
like that. I'm going to just let the thing go. I don't like dry firing it. The sights on it, I think he had a scope, but it's got these little click up sight things there. You can see, you know, if you want to shoot farther ranges, you have different yards on there and you can make it go up or down, you know, like that. And this is the gun that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone on. And so many people have gone over that story and said, no way, there's no way. And yet the majority of people still believe that Lee Harvey Oswald used one of these to kill a president. You know why? Because they don't want to accept the other option. The other option is that there are men, there are groups out there that are so powerful that they can murder a popular president, handsome president, beautiful wife, lovely children, popular and everything else, and they can kill the guy in broad daylight in front of hundreds of witnesses and give the American people a stupid story and just cover the whole thing up. Nobody ever goes to jail for it. And Lee Harvey Oswald, the little patsy, he's walking out of the prison, you know, and Jack Ruby comes up, shoots him, and the police go, oh, you know, they don't go like this to get the gun. They just lean back, you know? I mean, what a bunch of nonsense. But you see, it illustrates my point. The whole world lieth in wickedness. But the little lie that Satan creates with the Warren Commission and all the stuff that's going down through the years, the little packaged, nice little thing is, oh, it was just a bad guy. And all these shooter guys, you know. I was just somebody that was just disgruntled and they're, and they're, and they're dead now and they committed suicide or they're, or they're in jail or whatever else and the world's happy and safe again. You see? Give you another example. I'll make some friends with this one. How about the military and war? Uh, talk about another uh, example of the real world, the real thing being covered up. You know? Your country needs you. You need to fight for freedom. We need to fight to keep Americans free, you know. <laughs> uh, and then you look at the wars and what, the, what really goes on with the wars, and you realize it's just a huge, big scam. The military is not there to keep you free, okay? The military is there to fight wars of aggression in America. Other countries I won't talk about, but in America, the, the military is there to fight wars of aggression, to take oil, to get drug resources, and whatever else. There's other things too, but we'll stick with oil and drugs. Those are the two big ones. The military is there for the pharmaceutical industry to experiment on soldiers. Documented fact, there were uh, bills passed and things back under Bill Clinton, whereby the uh, medical establishment could come in and test experimental vaccines and things on soldiers. The military is also there. We use radioactive nuclear waste, depleted uranium, as ammunition. Isn't that wonderful? And you say, well, it, boy, it really blows holes through tanks and things and armor and whatever else. When you, you heat up that you know, depleted uranium, boy, it just punches holes right through. Yeah, and then it fractures and fragments and goes all over the place and it kills our own soldiers. Brilliant. Um, the military and war is another one of those things, you know, they get people, you know, coming by some soldier and they say, you know, so the guy could be dying in a wheelchair from depleted uranium and exposure to toxic chemicals from the first Gulf War. You can watch uh, Hidden Wars of Desert Storm is a good documentary on that. Thousands of soldiers are, have died because they were in that war and, and are sick and, and everything else. Thousands dead and dying. Say it that way. Okay. Established fact. But here comes some soldier. He could be dying in a wheelchair killed by his own military, by his own government, and people will say, thank you for your service. <laughs> service to what? Service to an evil uh, government that, that just takes its people, its citizens, and puts them in harm's way and destroys them? And then you get some soldier that fought and did his best for the military, and they stick him in a VA home somewhere, and then it, they just let the guy lay there in his own filth. The medical staff. Again, I've known of that happening. Decorated veterans. New Wolf One, it was a de he was a decorated veteran from World War II, and the son went in to, to see his dad. He was his dad, the veteran, decorated veteran. He's in a home, one of these VA homes, and the son went in to see him, guy I knew personally, and he said he went in and his dad was laying there. It looked like he'd been going to the bathroom for days and they hadn't changed him. He had rashes all over him, bed sores all over him. 
Thank you for your service. Uh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I saw a thing with this uh, Sawman Sawyer, special ops guy, this big special ops guy, you know, whatever else, and this war hero and everything else. And, and he got sick because <laughs> the military sends you into place to blow up chemical dump stuff. And oh, don't worry, it's fine. You're, you're safe. You're fine. Go in there and blow that stuff up. And the poor guy had all these health issues and everything else. And the VA's going, we're not paying for it. <laughs> Sorry. And, you know, I find it so ironic that the, that we had to go to war with Afghanistan um, right after 9-11 because they were the ones that were behind it. And that's where Obama, Osama bin Laden, Obama bin Laden, yeah. Osama bin Laden's hiding out there, you know, in this Af country of Afghanistan. And we got to go in there and... and because the Taliban had taken the opium production way down because of their beliefs as Muslims and things. And all of a sudden, America goes in there, and, and you can actually look up the video of Geraldo Rivera uh, interviewing a Marine commander, and the guy's saying, yeah, we're, you know, the Marines are protecting the opium fields where the people are there. And, and opium production went whoop, back up again uh, when the American soldiers came in. Because it's an indigenous crop and we got to be there to, you know, the, the people were trying to rebuild their economy and therefore we got to be there so that they can sell their opium. Um, and just ironically at the same time, you have the opi opioid thing, OxyContin and a lot of these other ones, that uh, abuse here in America just soared. So America goes in, sends its military in to a country where the opium production is down our soldiers come in guarding the fields, opium production soars, and back in America, opioid production goes way up, and now we have all these opioid crises all over this country. Oh, but let's, let's not talk about that because that would be looking at the real world for how things really are. It'd be better just to walk around with our eyes blinded. I don't want to look about it. I don't want to see it. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to talk about it. And you go to these waste places called churches, and you got the little nice little things. I look at some of the, the titles sometimes of these things, of these the sermons that these guys preach, and I think, my word, you have to be spiritually dead to sit in one of these services. Where's the truth? When do you hear the truth in those places? You don't. That's why I left them. And that's why I suggest you leave them too. But I say the best one for last. The real world. What is the real world? And this is an illusion that's going to be coming down before very long. And that is the issue of debt. Um, America is a land of illusion and delusion. All right. Uh, this, the people of this country are so delusional, it's just incredible. You know, we drive around, we, we got our nice vehicles, and we have our nice houses and everything else, and we can just go buy whatever we want with credit and we can just go out and just get ourselves more and more and more debt and if you if you eventually have to default and you just declare bankruptcy and you start over again why because people don't want to come to the place where they're broken people don't want to have to come to a place where they have to get down on their knees in the dirt and say god please help me i don't know what i'm going to do so satan has created the system the modern banking system with its fiat currency Printed currency. We could just print more money. Hey, here I got some money for you. There you go. You say, "Well, I used it up." Oh well, uh, here's some more. Here we'll, we'll just keep we'll just keep printing money and printing money and printing money. You say, "Well, well isn't that causing hyperinflation?" Well, sure, but it's it'll eventually work out. I mean, we're over twenty plus trillion of admitted debt here in America, but. It's okay. We'll, we'll uh, you know, Trump's going to fix it up. He, he, he'll make it better. And if he doesn't, then we'll get somebody else in and, and, and then he'll be our guy and or she or it or whatever else, you know. <laughs> People live in illusion. And sadly, a lot of Christians are the same as the lost in that area. They're drowning in debt. Living by faith. I don't think so. The just shall live by faith. I don't think so. Well, where's your next meal coming from? Um, well, that depends on if I've maxed out my credit card yet. Um, okay. <laughs> uh, did God provide a house for you? Uh, well, sure. He, gave, he got me a good deal on a mortgage. 
Really? Uh, okay. Um, is that mortgage always going to be there? Are you always going to be able to make your payments? Well, sure, because the economy's never been better. <laughs> you know? Um, sure, we've had more store closings this year, just this year alone, than we've had in any other year of American history. And, and, and sure, there's uh, millions of people going around that are at least three or more months delinquent in their car payments. And, and sure, there's, uh, you know, factory closings and, and the, the war, trade war between China and America, but the things are getting better. Evolution. What's going on? You're believing the lies that Satan is, you know, giving you, feeding you. Things are going to get better. They're not going to get better. We're going to bring revival to the church. We're going to see great revival in the future. You're crazy. You're crazy in the head. So I watch brother so-and-so and, -so and he's, he's been preaching revival that we're going to have a great revival. He's a liar. He's a deceiver. Somebody says good times are ahead. Nope. The good times that are ahead is when the body of Christ says, okay, come on up. Lord says, all right. Come on up. Catches us up. Come up hither. That's the good times that's a, that are ahead for us as Christians. All right. Just wanted to do this little study here and, and just just go over some of this stuff and this and you know, brethren, the debt thing uh, is a very very serious problem. All right. Uh, right now, I'm seeing a lot of the media. I I watch a lot of economists and things like that. Guys that are really up on the whole situation of what's going on. Stock markets just boom 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 like this. And I don't really follow the stock market thing that much. I look at uh, trends. Okay, I'm, I'm not a recommending Gerald Salenti of the Trends uh, Journal, I think it is what he is, but, but he has a statement which I agree totally with, and that is um, that current events form future trends. If you're seeing a lot of store closings, then it's going to be a trend that's going to continue in the future. You don't have stores closing because the economy is falling apart, and all of a sudden just blink, and it's better again. <laughs> uh, no, it doesn't happen that way. Current events. Quantitative easing number four they're talking about now with the Federal Reserve. In other words, they're going to print more money. Well, they print more money. There's more money out there. Then, therefore, it costs more to buy things. They have to take, you know, the prices of things up. And you look at what something cost 100 years ago compared to what it costs today, it's not good. All right? Um, money can be printed and printed and printed and printed and printed to just whatever, just insane, crazy levels. See, Zimbabwe, if you want to... You know, see examples of that. Two hundred trillion dollar bills going around over there. Um, was their economies falling apart? The Weimar Republic in Germany um, before World War II. Again, they're they're taking stacks of money to buy a, a loaf of bread. They printed too much money. You see, uh, biblical money is gold and silver. All right, uh, there's a limited supply, so you can't just make more of it. All right, it keeps price in control. But now we don't even have to have cash anymore. Now you can go to the store and you can just have your credit card and you can just get yourself in more and more and more and more debt to escape the reality of this world. That uh, people are poor. People are debtors. If you are a debtor, if you have lots of debts that you have to pay off, you're a slave. You're not free. You better pay that stuff off. I just, I guess the, the, the thing that, that sickens me the most is when I see professing Christians perpetuating a lot of the lies that Satan himself comes out with, telling people to go to public schools and, and college and university and things like that. Um, you know, I don't, I don't see too many people talking about the JFK assassination, but, you know, official history that lies about things, you know. I see Christians promoting that stuff. That's sickening. Uh, the military and war. You know, I see, you know, Christian young people, you can consider going in the military or people that profess to be Christians saying, I'm in the military and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, you mean there's nothing wrong with being in an organization that forbids you to, to witness for Jesus Christ? You know, you might be able to get away with it. Your commanding officer might not have a big problem with it or whatever. But if you went the whole way to the top, if you were court-martialed, you know you'd get in trouble. Especially if you came out and said sodomy is wicked all the pro-sodomy laws that have been passed by the military. you got to keep your mouth shut about that stuff. 
It's a problem. And how about the wars that we're fighting? The waste of resources and the waste of what are we doing over in these wars and things like this? You know, <laughs> you're, you're perpetuating a false system. And of course, the debt thing. The debt thing is huge. So many Christians are, are, are in debt. They're not living by faith. They don't want to look and say, okay, the Lord will provide. The Lord will take care of us. Hey, hey, Lord, we can barely afford food. What would you do, Lord, to provide for us with food? And the Lord says, uh, go on out there in nature. Go on out here. Hey, you know what? There's plants over in here. Herbs that you can eat. There's raspberries and blueberries and and red currants and elderberries and, and all these berries back in here that you can eat and it'll make you healthy. See this water right here? There's salmon in that water. See that forest back there? There's deer back in there that you can shoot and eat. And there's this and there's that. Do you realize how healthy it is to eat God's food that He provides? But it's a lot, uh, it's a lot quicker to just go to the grocery store and get out that card. I don't have a credit card, by the way. <laughs> I have a debit card, but you know, whatever, with the bank. But uh, I don't use it that much. But my whole point is, <laughs> this is the real world. Right here, what God makes. And you gotta look at this and you gotta see, as, beauty as, nature, as beautiful as nature is, and you see it in a lot of my videos, I film in some really beautiful spots, it's still, it's passing away. It's corruptible. It's not eternity. You need to think about eternal things. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. And um, I don't know how much rough stuff we're going to have to go through, brethren. And I've been saying this and preaching this for years and years and years. I've never once, as a preacher, rapture believer and preacher, and I can, you know, I'm not saying this out of pride, but I can destroy any of these post-trib arguments out there. They're ridiculous. They're stupid. But... As a firm believer that the body of Christ is going to be going up before the time of, the, of Jacob's trouble, people call it the pre-trib rapture. Bear with me. I have never once taught that Christians are going to get out before any suffering. Never. The Bible teaches if we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. Um, Christians have suffered a lot in church history, but it's not been at God's hands. Okay, um, And God is the one that opens that first seal that unleashes the Antichrist. Unless you're one of these post-trippers. Now they're trying to say, oh no, it's not actually God that does it. It's, it's not Jesus. He's just kind of, it's like he's opening up to see what's happening on the earth. He's not causing it. It's ridiculous. But the reality of it is, Christians won't be here to see the Antichrist unleashed. Proved that in many studies. But there's a lot of things that are going to be done to usher in that Antichrist kingdom. And uh, I hate to say it, but the system of debt the system of fiat currencies, of printed money, that has to be gone. Okay? Are we going to see a financial collapse? I'm going to be doing some more work on this in the future. Um, how to prepare for things like that. Um, how to get yourself ready. Uh, you got to look at the real world. You can't look at the media out there. That's If you're watching television media thinking you're getting the truth, you are being deceived. I mean, my word. You know... CNN, Fox, you know, Fox is like a radically pro-Catholic, you know, whole thing there. Um, you're being deceived by that stuff. You know, um, you have to understand things through a biblical worldview. That's the only way that you're going to understand the truth. The real world, as we've been talking about. Um, I pray you wake up to some of these things if you're saved. If you're lost, I pray you get saved. I pray you stop looking around at the... the temporal world and thinking that this is it things are going to get better and i can get that sports car and i can live in that house someday and i'm going to have this and i'm going to get those nice clothes and i'm going to... you need to get your relationship with god figured out the lord jesus christ so that is going to be it see you in the next study